Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. Uh, I have an actual review for you today of this uh, SACD player. Um, hope to get through it, through it quickly because I don't think that many of you are interested in these transports, but uh, uh, a member kindly sent this to me. It's an expensive one for our Marians. It costs uh, $7,500. Is this unit sitting over here? I know you can't see it that well, so <laughs> look at the picture in the review. It's a multi-format transport uh, that plays SACD and of course CD. Um, oddly for an SACD player, stereo only. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, use SACD format to get multi-channel high resolution audio, but uh, this is stereo only. So it's really for diehard two channel listeners. For those of you who don't know SACD's format that came out, I think 30 years ago, uh, during 1990s, late 1990s, um, and it was Sony and Philips's attempt to replace the CD with something better, with uh, high resolution, and of course at that time copy protection was a huge deal, so um, they've uh, put in various measures in there to basically make it impossible to uh, uh, rip these. There are some hacks out there using PlayStation and what have you to uh, take the copy, uh, make a copy, but it's not easy to find those hacks and um so in a way they succeeded with that but they uh, failed the larger war which is you know if you made the format so hard to access uh nobody wanted it anymore in the era of you know you could go online and download an mp3 why would you want to jump through all these hoops uh the le record labels at the time they thought this was their uh <clears throat> rescue card from piracy of mp3 and uh not realizing that extra bit of fidelity, even if it was there, uh, wasn't going to get anybody to adopt it. Um, CD was a major jump forward in fidelity and the little bit of performance that's left in the, uh, on the table as far as the CD just isn't going to get uh, that many people to adopt the format. It also uh, was in a big format war with another format called DVD Audio uh, from DVD Forum. And so they killed each other that way too. DVD Audio died completely. But SACD hasn't actually, as you can see, this player came out in 2017. And the digital version of this, uh, the DSD download that I showed in the last video, uh, has got even more legs now than SACD itself. So they're very high-end independent small vendors are, are producing the uh, content. Um, the uh, uh, the main class of people that like SACD these days are classical music, and there's decent library out there uh, on this thing. Okay, so uh, one other one unusual thing in this class of device is that it actually supports modern USB audio. Uh, so you just plug in a USB cable into it and it becomes a DAC, which is great because I can test it much easier that way, the DAC portion of it, than try to spin different uh, test CDs in there. And on that note, only a couple of uh, uh, SACD test discs, test discs became available when uh, you know these things were hot. One a prototype, one from Sony, and then another one by Philips. Uh, not much else past that. Uh, those are next to impossible to find, and I don't have one. Uh, I suppose I could go really search for one if I was testing these players all the time, but I don't. And uh, when I looked last week, there was just nobody selling uh, anything like that. Um, there are some other test clips on other samplers, and I don't trust any of those. Usually they're poorly generated. So anyway, out of necessity, I'm testing this using the USB, and then my audio precision analyzer is able to control it nicely, and we can run a full suite of tests. At the end, I'll show you some CD and SACD tests, but they're much more limited uh, compared to what I can do over USB. So as always, we start with our dashboard here, and uh, what the dashboard is that I digitally feed the uh, DAC a one kilohertz, perfect one kilohertz uh, tone in 24 bit uh, and 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate, and then we watch what what comes out of it. Everything outside of this one spike is noise and distortion. And unfortunately, we see a fair bit of distortion in here. Uh, this spike is going up to about minus 108 or so. And uh, uh, in this day and age, it's just not that great. Um, I have $100 DAX that way outperform this. But anyway, this is on the RCA output. Uh, we get slightly better performance if we go to balanced output, XLR output. 
and uh, but we still have our distortion although a little bit less now down to minus 110 db um, synad is the ratio of all these noise and distortions that you see relative to the amplitude of of uh, this main signal that we want. So it's ratio of unwanted to wanted, uh, expressed as a dB, the higher the number, the better uh, in that regard. And uh, 105 is actually surprisingly higher than I thought I was gonna see out of a Moran's product. Um, and uh, it lands uh, in above average, very good category, I call it. There are about 360 DAX that have been tested in here. It lands, you know, like I said, slightly above average. Average probably here. Uh, if I was testing a $99 DAC and it landed in here, I would say, hmm, they could do better because even $99 DAX not land in this blue area. And here we are in the next category down, and this is a $7,500 device. So better than expected, but not nearly as good as it needs to be. Um, quickly uh, measuring uh, a weakness in the unit, which is signal noise ratio dynamic range. And we see that it lands around 103, 104 dB. That's about 17 to 18 dB of dynamic range. Uh, most people buy these high resolution discs, expect to get a lot more performance than a CD. And unfortunately, we're not gonna get it uh, as far as the noise performance. Uh, you're limited by what the hardware can do as opposed to what the format can do. Um, a lot of times people complain, why are you testing just one kilohertz? You know, how does it perform with music with many more tones? Well, this is a simulation of music, if you will, uh, in that this test tone has 32 tones in it, and it's at high sample rate of 192 kilohertz. So we are testing high resolution audio. Here it does well, uh, almost 20 bits of uh, distortion free range. And that means from the tip here down to, uh, sorry, imaginary line in here that we would draw. And I give it credit that it's at minus 120 and minus 120 is about um, 20 dB, so uh, 20 bits, sorry. So it's pretty good. And it also doesn't have a lot of frequency dependency. A lot of times I test products and this starts to climb up here as frequencies get higher. But this is nice and flat, so good showing in here. Um, on linearity, linearity is just an accuracy test that says if we keep ch lowering the digital samples and then ask the DAC to produce the corresponding voltage, and we get rid of all distortion and noise. So we're just looking at the level itself. How accurate is it? And if it's perfectly accurate, this line would be at zero, meaning there's zero deviation. And I expect to see that out of, again, any DAC that's above $100. Here, we sort of start to struggle a little bit early on, and by the time we get to here, which is about my, uh, 20 bits, uh, we start to uh, you know go above my half a dB threshold that I'd like to see. So not good. Um, it's certainly not good for 7,500, but not embarrassingly bad either. There are you know, DACs that go up like this. But again, this day and age, performance is so optimized in standalone DACs that I'd like to see flat line in here, not this kind of accuracy error. Uh, most disappointing is this jitter test. Um, and and uh, uh, basic this test, what you want to see is this tone over here and these little ticks over here. Excuse me. Everything else is unwanted in here. And uh, when they're symmetrical, uh, around this main tone, there are jitter components. Uh, every, every frequency of jitter, if it's sinusoidal, generates one plus, one minus distortion spike. And uh, usually the levels are the same, so I'm not sure if these are exactly jitter components or not, but they, uh, they're definitely interference patterns or an unwanted, if you will. And they're so pronounced to be at very specific frequencies that a designer should be able to run a test like this and say, hmm, this is happening at plus or minus two kilohertz. So that means there's a source of two kilohertz interference in the DAC, in the unit. Where do I have a two kilohertz tone? Aha, uh -huh, it's in this circuit that has two kilohertz. Let me try to shield that. Let me try to filter that. Let me try to improve the power supply design. A um, lot of times also this kind of thing is input dependent. In this case, it is not because I'm running both uh, coax input, digital speed of input, and USB. Both of them show identical problem. That means that the, uh, the problem is endemic to the player design itself. These spikes are generated internally to the unit 
and it's just pure interference patterns. There's also very low frequency interference patterns, uh, jitter around the main tone. Whenever you see this widening, we call that a skirt. And uh, that's very low frequency jitter. So the plus and minus that it generates are hugging the 12 kilohertz tone uh, on this. Good news is that it's not audible. These things are uh, at threshold of hearing, and that's with a full amplitude, 12 kilohertz, which you don't get in music. So I don't don't think that you're going to hear jitter. But you know, from engineering, design, hygiene, which I expect in this class of product, I expect these problems to not be there. Uh, this unit, by the way, weighs 40 pounds, I think. So exceptionally heavy. So somebody went overboard and added 35 pounds worth of weight to this unit to be over-designed and over, you know, good, uh, overly good. And I expect the same thing in the electronic design, and it's not there. Um, the noise problem comes back to haunted in this test, which is intermodulation test, uh, 60 uh, hertz and seven kilohertz, two tones at the same time. And we were changing the amplitude from low to high. And that allows us to measure interference patterns between those two. But importantly, we're simultaneously measuring low frequency performance of the device and high frequency at the same time. Whereas with one kilohertz, we're sort of middle of the road. This thing has got treble and bass at the same time being measured. Uh, when this graph is sloping down, it means that it's noise dominant and it's not distortion that we worry about. And so from here to here is basically dominated by how noisy the unit is. I have two reference points. On top is a $9 headphone dongle from Razer. Uh, nothing special about it other than it's just a nine or 10 bucks throwaway uh, product. And down here is an older uh, DAC and headphone amp from Topping called the X3 Pro. And uh, this is two or three year old uh, technology and is way outperforming this Moran's unit, uh, S18 unit. It's got so much lower noise, it's about I don't know, 10 or 15 dB lower noise, which is hugely significant. And, uh, uh, you know, when we get down here and the, gra the graph starts to turn up, that means that noise is low enough that allows distortion to be seen. And the two match each other over here. And that is what I show in the dashboard. So in the dashboard is the best case situation for this product. But in reality, if you look at it as the music is, is quieter than maximum, it just doesn't have competitive signal to noise ratio. Not broken. I've seen high end DACs that are worse than this $9 dongle, but you know, not very good. When I got the unit, and I suspect that's the default, it has two filters only. Uh, modern DACs let you select, you know, one of six or seven or eight. Not that that's great necessarily. Um, and, uh, but this has only two. And the default one that was turned on is this filter one, which I know Moran's likes because even in their AV receivers, this is what they ship with. And this filter is extremely slow. What we want to do from theory point of view, when I'm playing 44.1 killer sampling, nothing above this line should be visible. That means the line should come here flat and then go down to zero. That's an ideal, of course. We're not going to get the ideal. And, uh, but we want something close to it. And this slow one that just goes on forever, it's just not good as you'll see in a second. Um, but it, luckily it has another filter, the filter number two. If you set that, uh, it, it rolls it up, but it still takes its time to, to come down and it never comes down a ton, only 80 dB uh, on this thing. Notice that if you use a slow filter, you actually get a roll off that starts around 10 or 12 kilohertz. So it actually, takes away some of the highs as it plays. So it, it can have the effect of having a softer highs if your hearing is excellent. Uh, most of us older folks are not gonna hear the difference. But if you're younger and your hearing extends all the way up to 17, 18, 19 kilohertz, uh, you're gonna hear two or three dB droop in high frequencies. So if your system was bright and you don't like bright sounds, uh, the slow filter, um, will give you that response. It's not the way to correct your speaker. You should go and, uh, you know, use equalization to correct it because this has other problems. When you don't do what the theory says, which is chunk, uh, turn everything off, you get this kind of response. So the red is, is with uh, uh, filter number two. This is the response you get. And uh, this is a $99 three-year-old uh, DAC. 
you can see how much higher the noise and distortion is uh, because we didn't filter enough of that uh, ultrasonic and at any rate the DAC is not all that great. Um, if I change the uh, sampling rate to 192 or I use one of the other filters, we can get better performance down to here, but we're still way short of what a $99 card is doing. So we've got a bunch of ultrasonic noise and hash and other problems all intermingling uh, because this measurement goes up to 90 kilohertz uh, bandwidth, so it goes way above audible band, as it should in this case because you've got a high-res player, you expect it to perform well above uh, audible uh, frequency. Sorry, I've got a hair on my nose. <laughs> um, so anyway, moving right along. Um, I don't have a test CD, as I mentioned, for SACD, uh, um, and so, but I do have music uh, uh, that I try to play in it. Um, first of all, that I try to uh, play was uh, Antonin's uh, Vorjax uh, uh, concert that I have in here, and Oddly, even though it's an SACD, uh, you can see the symbol down here. I put that in there and it just said no disc. It did not try to read it and wouldn't play it at all. Very strange. Uh, maybe is this is multi-channel. Uh, I wonder if that's the problem. I don't know. But uh, uh, I had this, uh, another concert uh, classic that I played in there. And, and this is the spectrum that you see in here. So I just played the first track. I forget which track I played. And we see this spectrum over here. Um, if you look in here, we have what is expected to be in music, which is the low frequencies are always the loudest. And as the frequencies go higher and higher and higher, the level drops you know, more and more and more. Uh, a natural music recording would just continue with this slope going down to nothing. In this case, that's not what's happening. Uh, it goes down here, and then all of a sudden it goes up in what looks to have a very specific pattern of noise. This is the classic DST64 or 1X DST, which is what SACD is, um, noise shaping. They have this one-bit encoding that generates horrendous amount of uh, noise in here. And using a feedback loop, they're able to take that noise and push it up into a higher frequency, essentially modulates it up to a higher frequency and spits it out out of the output of the DAC. There's some kind of filter in there that is causing these notches. So there's some attempt inside this player to filter some of that, but usually they don't want to filter down to 20 kilohertz because then they can't say it's a high res player. And so what happens is that you pump out all this noise into your system. And this is again, analog output coming out of the player as it's playing a real SACD. This is not examining some digital bits. This is an actual waveform coming out. And the amplitude of this noise at 100 kilohertz is the same as music at two or three kilohertz. So this is quite high. Yes, we get this kind of noise in other DACs and some power amplifiers and so forth, but they're rarely this high where they're competing with your music. So, you know, what does that do? I don't know. The amplifier will probably take 100 kilohertz and try to amplify it. Uh, you better hope that that amp was tested up to 100 kilohertz and it doesn't oscillate, uh, because if it oscillates, it could do crazy things. And uh, um, you could also get into modulation this uh, distortion. Your speaker probably won't play any of this, but who knows what your tweeter does. Your tweeter may have resonances at 20, 30 kilohertz that get activated by this. So instead of having it level this low, they may be up here. And they may also intermodulate down in audible rant. Now, these are very rare things. But the point being is that there's nothing good in here. Uh, you know, I wanted a, a high res music. I wanted to go, this is CD basically. I wanted to go past whatever was in here and capture that. And uh, instead of capturing that, the format spits out all this noise and stores it in there permanently in the file and the player happily plays most of it. So uh, this came up in the last video I did on Octave Music. People said, well, you just examined the file, um, you know, that, that's all filtered out in a player. Well, you can see a real player over here and a high-end one, definitely not filtering it, it's spitting it out faithfully. So not good. I didn't think anybody cared about CD playback on, on a transport like this, but people on the thread argued and wanted to see CD testing. So I ran a couple of tests um, when I'm 
playing CD and testing it, I can only run static tests. I can't do the sweeps like the IMD that you saw because my analyzer can't control what the player is doing. But I do have just a standard one kilohertz tone and I play that and I got this, you know, distortion spray. Uh, but the cyanide's around 91 dB. Best case, ideal is 96 dB, 97 dB. And if you allow for dithering and other things, 91 dB is as, almost as good as it gets for... Uh, um, playing back 16-bit content as far as sign out. Maybe you can get up to 93 or 94 dB. So this is 2 or 3 dB worse than what it should do. Uh, this. So it's basically giving you 15 dB of, of uh, performance instead of 16 dB. Uh, but it's not something I would lose sleep over. And there was some discussion about how is the decoding done on, uh, on this player and whether it converts everything to DSC or not. Uh, so I ran the same test, but took a wideband spectrum, and there is some noise out here, um, but I'm not sure what that tells us. Uh, this notch in here is kind of strange. Um, so I don't know uh, what it's doing. Uh, by the way, these spikes are aliasing, uh, uh, I shouldn't say, uh, imaging problems because the filters are not very good. Uh, this is what happens when you don't filter things. You get this thing and you get a shadow of it at sampling rate minus the... Uh, frequency that you were testing so um, but anyway uh, CD rate is fine but I don't know why you want to play CDs this day and age on transport I know some people do it I would personally just rip it and be done with it anyway so where are we uh, a lot of times I'm fearful that somebody buys these things and spend all this money and they get incredibly poor performance which is very common in high-end audio that's not the case in here Moran's clearly has done some homework in here to make sure that this is this performance is competent and it's not embarrassingly bad it wasn't just designed by you know ear and pride that it would sound good um, it was done uh, with some care. Uh, enough care? No. Uh, you know, this, I shouldn't be able to buy a $99 DAC and weigh out performance, $7,500 unit. But uh, seeing how this is basically gets close enough to a transparency, if you have it and you like playing as a CD physically, um, you know, by all means, this is one option for you um, on this. Uh, are there cheap units that work just as well? I don't know, and it's hard to test them if they don't have USB input. So, you know, it's it's not up to me at this point to recommend or not recommend this device. If you're a forum member, you can go and, and vote on my on reviewed products, and you can see that most people, are, I think, are voting it, well, yeah, it, more or less correctly. They're saying it's not terrible, is the half of the people, and a quarter say it's fine, and a quarter say it's bad. And, and then if couple of people think it's great. Um, but uh, if you want to impact these things, join Audio Science Review and uh, you all too get to uh, vote how good a product is and whether it should be recommended or not and not just me on this thing. Okay, um, don't have anything else for you. I'm hoping to keep up with the text reviews, but in general, there are probably 10 to 20, 30 reviews in writing that I do versus what you see in videos. So if you want to see more of these, I suggest uh, staying current with, with the website. Okay, see you in a future video. Bye-bye.